Coming up on Unpacked. Um, I think growing up, I didn't even know that you can be in a same-sex relationship. Something like adoption was the last resort. We wanted to have an um, interracial child. Mm -hmm. And then she pulled off the test. And she said, what do you see? I'm like, two lines. It all went smoothly. It was amazing. Everything just fell into place. A same-sex couple that has had a child together via IVF joins us to share their story. Let's unpack. Norsim Dadi and Poppy Jacqueline met at a backpackers in 2016, and after three years of dating, they tied the knot in December 2020. This year, the couple, who are based in Makanda, formerly known as Gramstown, welcomed their baby girl, who was conceived using IUI. This is their story. Let's unpack. Joining us via Videocon is Norsi. Welcome to the show, Norsi. Hi, Lebu. How are you? I'm great, thanks. And you? Good, thanks. And also joining us via video con is her partner, Poppy. Poppy, welcome to the show. Hi, Lebu. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's jump straight into it. Um, let me start with you, Poppy. How did the two of you meet? So we met in 2016. We both met while we were staying at a backpackers. Um, and we realized that we were from the same town. So we became friends in 2016, and then we started dating in 2017. And was this a backpackers while you were traveling in another country or right here at home? It was here. Um, I was on my way to uh, KZN for a funeral, actually, and Nossi was working there. She does field work, and mm. she was there doing field work at the time. Mm. So just in terms of your own personal journey, uh, Nossi, were you somebody who always wanted to have kids or did it feel like it wasn't an option for you or you didn't want kids? Well, for me, um, growing up, I always thought that I didn't want kids as part of my life, you know, going forward. Um, not because I didn't think it was possible. It was just my my idea. And then I, I met Poppy and she was, uh, she wanted a kid strongly. And so... I changed my views, not changed my views, but I was willing to do it with her because mm. I also thought I could be a good parent. So that's how we decided to continue with that. So prior to being with Poppy, being a person who was dating individuals of the same sex, had you actually explored the idea of how it is you would have children if you would have children? Uh, you know what, Leo? Um I was an innocent, naive child growing up and that thing never changed. And I'm from the rural area, so most things you don't know. And up until I met Poppy, I didn't know how else to have a child besides having a boyfriend or a husband. So I had never explored that route until Poppy came up and um, started looking into it. And then I, I was learning the different types that exist. And yeah, so it was only with Poppy. So, Nosi, I think it's important that you're mentioning that because um, maybe we take for granted the fact that being exposed, it would seem like such an obvious thing to say, how, but wouldn't you know there are other ways to have children? So for you, you were never exposed to that type of information. You just thought if you have a boyfriend, then you can have children. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you think that's normal because I was brought up in that space and... Um, I think growing up, I didn't even know that you can be in a same-sex relationship. So, because television was not really showing that, and I went to a Christian school, so that didn't exist, and I went to varsity, and then it sort of was coming up. So, being exposed to something that had to do with um, being able to pregnant, to get pregnant mm. uh, without having a male involved didn't even exist. So... Mm. It's, I mean, it's showing now with us having ocean. You know, people are curious. You know, they mm -hmm. want to know how it happened. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you can see that people really, they're not informed. Even some same-sex couples that um, do get curious, they, they're not sure. They have some idea, but they don't know how really. So Poppy, share with us, um, did you always want to have children prior to meeting your partner? 
Yes, I did. I think from around the age of 15, I knew that I wanted to be a mother. Um, I, you know, I wasn't always, I didn't always identify as a lesbian. So I always thought it was going to be an easy process for me too. But as I started to date women and I realized that I would probably end up um, staying with a woman eventually, that I started to look into how I could have a family. Mm. Um, so I, I did know more than Nossi. I knew that there were options for us. Um, but we waited, I waited a long time until I was ready. And when I met Nossi, I think that was when I decided that, you know, this is the time. I'm ready now to start a family. So when did you actually um, come out to yourself and acknowledge that, you know, you are not a heterosexual individual? So I was about 24, 25 when I came out and I acknowledged it um, and that I came out to my family around the same time, within a few months. Um, but I'd kind, of, I'd kind of known when I was younger growing up that I wasn't, um, my sexuality wasn't the typical, wasn't like other girls that I knew. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think I always knew but I was able to, I mean, I did have boyfriends growing up and they were loving relationships. Mm. Um, but yeah, it never, there was always something missing. So when I finally did get into a relationship with a woman when I was around 25, I knew that I was a lesbian. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. And on your side, Nossi, when did you discover for yourself that you aren't heterosexual? Um, that's... It's an interesting question. You know, growing up, I never had a boyfriend. You know, when you're a teenager, you sneak around and mm. you want to, when you're walking from school, other kids are like walking with the boys. I I was never interested in boys. It mm. was it was not even a thing that crossed my mind. So it was only when I was 21 when I was like, you know, I'm too old to have never dated mm. or have never had a boyfriend. So then I went out and I found myself a boyfriend. Um, and I, I was with this guy, uh, for four, three to four years or so. Um, but <clears throat> I, it just wasn't a thing for me. There was too many things I didn't like about that relationship. And um, I, was do I was pretty much doing it for the society, I think, and my mm -hmm. parents because it's an expectation. Um, and then I grew up and in my like 24, 25, I um, came into Grahamstown. My grandson is a bit open-minded mm. and things are happening. So I started exploring and I realized, so oh, actually, I don't like boys. I really don't like boys. Mm. Um, so it was, yeah, it started much later, like 2014, 2015, so to my late 20s. But then it was also difficult for me to accept that's who I am mm. because how can I be? I, I was born a girl. I'm supposed to be with a guy and, you know, um, so it was, it's a journey, it's still a journey for me, um, but I think Poppy has helped, you know, uh, slowly help me be out there about who I am, because mm. then you start um, not feeling ashamed, but you don't want people to see it in public, or people going to say when you're holding hands with a girl or you're kissing a girl, so it, it's, it's a process, it's, it's not an easy one, given my background as well, you know. Okay, so now the two of you get together. And as you already shared earlier that Poppy's the one who really wanted to have kids, um, how was the idea first introduced to you and what were your initial thoughts? <laughs> um, it was introduced as, I think it was our second year dating. Mm. And then she said, I want to have a kid. Mm. And I said, I don't want to have a kid. And then it was, I think it started off as an argument and her being sad that how can she be with someone who doesn't want a child because that's always been her dream. And then, you know, I I, I shut down when, when it comes to mm. things that I don't know how to deal with. So then we would let that go and then it would come back again as a, like, as, as, as a conversation. Mm. And I think in like year three, or at the end of year two, year three, then uh, we started talking about it now openly and me... Um, thinking about it a little bit more instead of just shutting it out completely. Because then I was deciding if if I want to be Poppy with Poppy longer than just, you know, dating or fleeing stage, then I do have to consider um, her feelings mm. and, you know, uh, then see how we go forward. And then, yeah, I was like, okay, I was scared. I was scared. Mm. 
very scared. So, um, yeah, I was like, okay, why not? I don't have anything to lose. Let's let's give it a go. And yeah. What was, was it, until what was it was that you were so afraid of that you say that you were scared? <laughs> Being a terrible parent mm. and not knowing how, you know, it, it's it's a child. It's this thing that is de- fully dependent on you mm. and uh, for a while. Uh, but it, it also, uh, I believe that parents and the environment, they model what adult you're going to be. Mm. And so it's like... Uh, Am I going to put them in the right environment? Are they, are they going to have good education? Am I going to provide them all the necessary things for them to be a good adult, but and also an independent adult? And I was just, you know, you judge yourself a lot because you, you almost want to be perfect and you want to be better than where you come from or mm. your background. So it's a lot of things to put into place. It, you, for me, having a child wasn't just having a child because that just, it has to be more than that. Yeah, yeah. And for you, Poppy, what was the way you had suggested or what ways did you have in mind at the time when this discussion was happening? You mean in terms of how we would get pregnant? Yes. So I, I already had um, Or let me say even of- how you would have a child because... It, it, you know, having a child as a same-sex couple, the options are also adoption or surrogacy or, you know, yeah. the various options. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I knew the, the various options. For me, something like adoption was the last resort. I really wanted to carry a child. Mm. Um, so I knew that I biologically wanted to carry a child and I wanted this child to be biologically mine. So, you know, I... We did a lot of research online and I had a really good uh, gynecologist who is also a fertility specialist and she talked me through the options. So I have a condition called um, PCOS or polycystic uh, ovaries. Mm. And so I do have some struggles with ovulation. So I had to go on some fertility treatment and she talked me through all the different steps, but mm. she assured me that we could do an IUI, which is an intrauterine insemination mm. Um Yeah, so we went that route. And if that didn't happen for us, then we would have to go down another route like IVF. Mm. Um, So that was our plan um, that we discussed with our fertility doctor as we progressed. And what what would then, just so we get clarity, would have been the difference between the IUI and the um, in vitro uh, IVF? IVF, yeah. So an IUI is also known as artificial insemination. Mm. And it's basically a process of um, tracking your ovulation. Um, You can take fertility treatments for that. Mm. And you go in several times and you get scans to make sure that you have ovulated, how many eggs are there, how many are viable. And you do that all with scans. Um, And then you you get your donor sperm, which is a process in itself, but Mm. you order that donor sperm in advance. And then a fertility doctor will inseminate uh, that that, um, specimen using a catheter through your cervix. So it's all done in-house. It takes like, I think we were there for half an hour. The procedure Mm. itself took five minutes. It was really, really simple and straightforward, um, the procedure itself. So, yeah, whereas IVF, there's a much longer process for that. Mm. You have to extract, um, actually, you have to make sure you ovulate, then you go in for a procedure where they extract those eggs and they fertilize those eggs outside of Mm. the womb and then they um, implant them back in. Mm. And it's a a lot more expensive, Mm. um, but a lot, there's a lot better chances for success with IVF, but it is a lot more expensive. Mm. So then, uh, so now you are at the point where the IUI was the one that was suggested to you and what happened next? So IUI was suggested to us. So yeah, over the the first thing I had to do was track, um, when my period started, once it started, sorry if I don't get the exact steps correct, but I think from the day my period started, I started taking some fertility treatment. Mm. So I took that and then there was uh, about every three days I would go in to see my fertility specialist Mm. and she would check to see uh, have I ovulated and things like that. And then two days before the insemination, we had um, an injectable that Nossi and I had to do at home. 
Um, and then, yeah, two days later, we went into to the doctor, to our fertility doctor, and we did the insemination. Before we so get to, two weeks. To, to the insemination, was it already predetermined at this point that you were the one who was going to carry because it's something you always wanted, or is it still a discussion that you needed to have? I think I think it was quite an easy decision for Nasi and I because I had always wanted mm. to have a child myself. I, I felt very strongly about it, mm. and I was also older. I am older than Nasi; I'm three mm. years older. Um, by then, I was thirty-four, so we just it just made sense that I would go first, essentially, mm. because actually our plan is that Nasi will carry our second child. Mm. Um, so yeah, it just it, it there wasn't really um, a debate. It was quite a simple decision for us that mm-hmm. I would go first. Yeah, and then Nosi, maybe share with us. You know, obviously um, we've spoken about um, the procedure up until the point of insemination. How did you go through the process of sperm donors and choosing sperm donors? So the fertility clinic that we were in touch with that Poppy was talking about, um, they are in touch with sperm banks in South Africa. Mm. Um, and I think they, they got us list from two or three, I don't remember, to three banks. And then um, you there's a long list and you had to choose what you're looking for or what you like about the person because the list doesn't have an, um, a real name of the person. Uh, all the details. Mm. So we had to choose according to, for Poppy, because Poppy is, is white and I'm black, and if we're going to have a child, we wanted to have a, um interracial child. Mm. Is that what you call it? Not Because it's not colored. Yes. Um, so she had to have a, ha, have to have a black donor. That's mm. rare on the list. So mm. we had like a handful of, of um, I think, five. Um, and then we were like choosing according to your, education, their height, um, their uh, color eyes, and what they were, like, which, what's this, um, Kosa, Sutu, Zwana, you know, that kind of thing. And then we had, we chose three profiles, and then we send them back, and we say we would like a full profile of them. And then that tells, that, that tells you everything, like, from their, their mother, their grandparents, both sides, and uh, if they have any pre-existing conditions, and then you can choose according to that, and they have a picture of them as a child, um, and then you can have a look-alike, so you get to see what they look like. But they do have a structure of what the face, the ears, the yes. eyes, what they would look like. And yeah, so we chose from from that list. It wasn't an easy decision to make. It took mm. yeah, <laughs> it took about a month or two because it's a lot to decide on mm. and just go with one person. So yeah. Do you feel, Poppy, that you had sufficient information to choose or do you wish, and obviously we understand why because of the anonymity, uh, but do you wish that you were able to access everything about the person, see a picture of what they look like now, maybe even speak to them if if you could? So, yes, I, I feel like I would have liked more information. So in South Africa, um, there is a law that says that donors can never, they're completely anonymous and they can never be contacted mm. um, by any offspring. So I think that's unf- I think that's unfortunate. And I think, uh, you know, in other countries, they do have a more open policy that when, when a, a, an offspring is turns 18, they can perhaps contact, or at least they have options for that. Mm. Um, whereas in South Africa, you don't. So yes, um, but in terms of more information, I think we could have, had more information, medical history particularly, I would have liked more information on. Um, but, you know, some of these, it's, you also get what you pay for. There are some um, banks that have sperm from overseas and then they do have much more information mm. for those individuals. But when you're looking at local donors, um, you don't get as much as mm. I think you should. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, I mean, what what type of costs are actually involved. You don't have to give me the figures uh, exactly, but I think it will just be helpful for somebody that's watching that may think this is the route that we would like to go through, um, even if it's just a single person, um, so that, you know, they have an idea of where to expect certain financial expectations of them. So we weren't, it it really depends on the individual and how much, um, help you might need or what fertility doctor or what clinic you go to. But 
I would say that the whole process, um, so, so the, the donor sperm can cost anywhere between like 5000 to 30000 depending on which bank you get it from, depending on if you choose a local donor or a donor from overseas. So you can, I mean, we, I think it cost us about six or seven for, for the, the donor specimen itself. And then the, the medical costs from start to finish, I would say, oh, um, maybe, you know, 20 grand upwards from that. So it is quite a expensive thing and it can get costly if you are not successful. So luckily we were, but one round, um, yeah, over, over 20,000, I, th- I think you're looking at, um, going private. The medical aids do not pay for fertility treatments. Yes, apparently it's an elective procedure, which I think should be challenged at some point uh, through our legal system. But conversation for another day. Um, You're saying that you have to pay for the the sperm, but a person Mm. might be thinking to themselves, why are you paying for sperm if it was donated for free? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm sure it's to do with how they store the the sperm or the transport um, and and the the uh, the assessment they make of the individual. I think there are, are costs involved. Mm. Um, so I don't think the donor himself gets um, paid for his donation, um, but I do think it's it's a matter of how yeah how they the, the other costs that are involved with storing the sperm. And Nosi, were you concerned about the fact that there were so few um, donors for your criteria, in this case, a black South African man, that, you know, your child might find themselves having lots of different siblings? (laughs) That they might date one day? Um, They can only have have six. Oh, wow. Okay. That's Um, still, it's still, it's still, you know, cities are small. Yeah. You know what, Lem? Um, I was saying to Poppy, you, it's okay for us when we're here in the Eastern Cape because maybe chances of um, people that need a sperm are limited here. Mm. But as soon as they go to varsity, or maybe they, they go find a job, they're obviously going to go to big cities, so Cape Town, your Joburg, and mm. Durban. And your conversation isn't going to be, oh, so do you know your dad? Is is gonna go from you know from a bar wherever you met, and then at the later stage, it's gonna come out that actually we were both sperm um, donations and yeah. whatnot. So I am sort of worried, but not too worried about it. Um, I, I'm hoping that they look alike so much, and that they will want to find out because uh, we're gonna bring up Ocean, knowing that obviously she's gonna know because none of us can you know we don't produce sperm, so she's gonna know that she was. Um, through this process, she was born through this process, mm. um, so that it's always it's okay for her to talk about it if it ever needed to come up. But yeah, I am. I mean, I'm a bit scared about that. And she, this guy that we got the sperm from, has had six. Um, we don't know if they're all successful, but she has. All, all of his has been, have been used because wow. we checked for the second. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Poppy, so what happened next? I mean, um, you'd gone through the process of preparing the body. You'd now done the search on the sperm donor list. Talk us through the insemination process that you went through. Obviously, this is um, all timed uh, and we are monitored throughout the process to make sure that we optimize the chances of a successful um, insemination. So. Once um, I've ovulated and they've confirmed that, then you come in to do the procedure. The procedure is really easy. You, you go in um, and they they basically wash, I think they make sure they wash the, the specimen and they, they make sure everything's in order there. They check, I think, the, the, the sperm count of the sperm just to make sure everything's in order. Um, and then it's, you know... And easy. It's, it's almost like having a pap smear. It feels like that, where they they use a, a catheter-like device to implant the sperm through the the cervical wall. Um, and yeah, it takes about five minutes, and then you sit there for about ten minutes just to relax. And um, and then it's done. And then you wait. And then you wait for two. They call it the the dreaded two weeks or the the terrible two week wait because that's the time when you're you're waiting to see whether it was successful or not. 
So yeah, that two weeks feels like two years. <laughs> Are there any rules that they give you about those two weeks? Um, example, being intimate or not being intimate, do they put any restrictions on you? Well, I mean, no, not not in terms of being intimate. Um, the only thing they asked is that, you know, we we don't test. They, I think it's, it's more... Um, to make sure we don't stress too much mm. about it, but they don't want you to, to do any at-home tests because they said they won't be accurate. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you wait for two weeks, and then at the end of that two weeks, you, you have a blood test. There, there really weren't any special, um, yeah, things that we had to do or not do. Hey, Nossi, I don't know if you remember anything, but, yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. So you then were fortunate, uh, Nossi and Poppy, and it it was positive for the first time. Norsi, what was it like getting those news? <laughs> I didn't believe it. Um, uh, we went for a walk on the beach with the dogs, and obviously Poppy had broken the rule of testing at home. But uh, the, the, <laughs> you were the lab, too anxious, the Poppy. <laughs> yeah, uh, but but she kept it from me until we went to PE. And the blood was taken and she actually received the call um, that e- that afternoon before we went for a walk. So she knew that it was time because then I was going to shout at her for testing before. Um, so we went for the walk and then on, we, she made us walk on top of the dune. And I didn't get why we have to walk on the, on the dune instead of just walking on the flat surface. But anyway, we went with it and then she pulled off the test. And she said, what do you see? I'm like, two lines. She's like, what does that mean? I'm like... I don't know, but then I knew. So I was excited. (laughs) I was happy. And then, because then it's positive, then you start getting scared because it's the first trimester. Yeah, and I mean, for for, for the viewers that are watching, the first trimester is quite a risky period in the sense that the pregnancy um, won't necessarily last throughout the trimester. Is that what the doctor advised you as well? Mm. Pops? Yeah, um, certainly. There are, you know, the the first three months are the most um, scary months of the pregnancy. We didn't tell anybody. I mean, the doctor didn't advise us of that. We just chose not to tell anybody until we reached three months um, because we were very nervous. We were first time parents and we didn't know, you know, what could happen. Um, You read a lot of terrible things on Dr. Google. So... Yeah, but it all went smoothly. It was amazing. Everything just fell into place. I had a really easy pregnancy. We were very lucky. Did the uh, the doctor actually give you a heads up that because of the procedure that you're doing, there is a possibility or a likelihood of multiples? Yes, certainly. Um, they did, actually. They, she's, I had two... Uh, when I went for my scan before the insemination, I had actually... I actually had three eggs, but one was a lot smaller. So she said, you've got two viable eggs here. So the chances of you having twins or multiples is 10% higher than the general population. So when we went in to go for our first scan, (laughs) we were nervous about there being two heartbeats. I mean, we would have been happy either way. But um, I was quite, like, excited at the prospect. But anyway, it was one heartbeat. But yes, certainly, they say it's about 10%. So... And I actually just wanted to comment on that. The the IUI procedure is 20%, has a 20% success rate, Mm. which is actually quite low. Mm. Um, So, yeah. And then the chances of multiples is 10% higher than the average Mm. person. Yeah. Look, I think you are super, super blessed uh, that you were able to get it the first time and the pregnancy was viable and you carried uh, all the way um, uh, to to being able to give birth. So what was the delivery and the birthing process like? <laughs> um, it was amazing. I mean, it was terrifying and amazing at the same time. Um, we live in quite a small town and we were actually, we planned to give birth at our hospital uh, where we'd had our fertility treatment and so on. And that's about an hour and a half away. So we planned to go around my due date to PE where I was set to deliver. And um, she came a day before she was due, Mm. just, you know, like clockwork. We thought we might have to have an induction, but I didn't Mm. need an induction. And she came quickly. I started going into labor 
Um, I had some very mild pains around eight o'clock the night before. And then I went to bed. Nossi woke me up at 1 a.m. because I was screaming and crying in my sleep. Wow. And she's like, what's going on? And um, I was having contractions in my sleep. And yeah, I like had a shower. I think I even, Nossi laughs at me because I went and had a shower and shaved my legs. Um, in between my contractions. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. And then so we drove to the hospital. Nasi was a bit nervous. She kept missing the turning. So it was it was all very exciting. And then we um, got there. And because of COVID, Nasi couldn't come in with me initially. She had to wait outside because we were still waiting for her COVID test results mm. to come back because we'd only just had them that day so that she could come into the hospital with me. But the hers hadn't come through. Mm. Um, so I was in the hospital alone while I was um, progressing. And eventually when I was in active labor, Nossi's results had come through, they let her in. And by the time she came in, I was ready to push. And the whole thing, I think, I, I started getting very severe contractions around 1 a.m. And then by 8.30, she was born, 8.30 a.m. Yeah. And how how is the little one doing now? And how old is she now? So Ocean is six months and she's absolutely amazing. She is the most beautiful, easygoing baby. I mean, I've people always talk about sleep deprivation. We've been really blessed. Um, yeah, she's just a delight. We've we've really loved every every second of it. And Nossi and I have been primarily alone. Like we haven't had my family over there overseas, yeah. so they couldn't come because of COVID. Nossi's family have also been away and they haven't been able to come and visit us. So it's just been me and Nossi and Ocean. And it's really been a beautiful, beautiful time. It really has. I mean, it has its challenges, like anybody becoming a parent for the first time, it does have its challenges. But yeah, we're very lucky. Nossi, do you feel like um, there are parts of the process that you wish you had been more included on? And I'll, I'll give you an example I've heard of lesbian couples who will say that because they want both to feel a part of, more a part of the child, that they would use the egg of the one partner that is not carrying um, so that they are both involved, if that makes sense. Did you ever have those feelings? No. Mm. Um, I, I always knew that the baby will be as much mine as it is Poppy's, mm. um, whether it's genetic or not, because if we decided to adopt, then it would be the same thing. So mm. for me, it wasn't wasn't really about um, that the first child is Poppy's or uh, not mine. So I I never felt anything like that. Ocean is as she's she's closer to me than she is to Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like that conversation is offline. <laughs> and and do you think that you would have considered having your DNA as close as possible, as in a donor being somebody like your brother, for example, um, in your case, Norsi? Um, We did discuss that briefly because Poppy, um, you know, culturally in, in our, in, in a black community, um, kids are accepted more when they they look alike or people know that they're from that family. So Poppy was like, maybe we should ask one of your brothers because my brothers look a lot my, like me and their mm. kids always come out looking like me more than them. Mm. So she was like, we should ask <clears throat> your brother to donate. I was like, it's no. I, I didn't want it because it yeah. feels like incest. So <laughs> my child is going to have my brother as you know, yes. um, or, you know, uh, and umalume or that ke- that thing. But at the same time, the father, it, it's the father. I mean, we won't call them that, obviously, but it family talks and mm. things change. And that, that if my brother ever decides that maybe for some reason he can't have kids all of a sudden, mm. or he hasn't had a boy and the child turns out to be a boy, then all of a sudden he's going to be, he wants to be a father to the boy because he wants an A. Mm. So I was like, it's too complicated. Mm. Mm. I'd rather we go with a, with an anonymous person and then at least we've got less challenges with that. We'll, we'll deal with the family if it ever becomes an issue. I, I completely get that and respect your reservations because it's not like back in the day where um, secrets were encouraged in families where it's like nobody must tell anybody and it comes out mm-hmm. much later. So on that note, what are you going to tell Ocean when she's older? 
<laughs> um, so Ocean will always know that the person who gave birth to her biologically, the person that carried her, is Poppy. Mm. Um, but I am also her mother because I wanted her so much to be born and I I loved her and it wasn't like a, an accident that I met Poppy pregnant mm. and I decided to stay. I actually wanted her as my child as well. Mm. So um, she's mine. Yes, it's a not a normal family because mm. there's two mums, but I am also her mum and so he she's related to my brothers and my um, nieces and nephews. Mm. So that's going to be what we instill in her. And hopefully we don't have any kickbacks from the cousins when they they, they do get bigger. But we, we will have to try and bring her up to be a strong person because she is, she might mm. have a lot of negativity from the community, the school she goes to and the kids that she plays with. So we're hoping that she will grow up to be a strong person um, hearted in a, in a strong individual who will understand that people don't always understand. Poppy, do you um, uh, have an answer for her when she does say she would like to find out who her donor is? I think that is a, we, we have talked about that, Nossi and I, and it, we will have to be as honest as possible with her. I think that is um, always going to be the case with Ocean and, um, we're going to be understanding that the, that maybe that's what she would want to do. And we're going to give her as much information as we have about the donor. We will share all of that with her when she's ready and she wants to talk about it. Um, but she'll be aware that um, that she won't be able to, to make contact with, with that donor, not because we don't want her to, but because that is what the law says in, in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we'll support her through that. Uh, I think the most important thing is that we are honest and we are understanding and we are um, always um, together as a family and loving whatever, you know, challenges she may have with this. We are, we are a unit mm-hmm. and we're there for her. Any final uh, words or info that you'd like the viewers to know about you? I'll start with you, Nosi, you and your story. Um, not much, eh? Um, I just wanted to mention, though, that uh, we've made it a point that Ocean has both surnames. Mm. So she's a, this is Ocean Mtati Eagles. Mm. So she's got a double barrel surname. Um, but about her journey... And we are, I think we've already spoken about it, Um, but also just for people to be aware that, you know, same-sex relationships, small towns, and people don't always understand. And um, I know for me specifically, being in the rural areas, being from the rural areas, it's not a thing that you talk about it out loud, especially because I don't stay there. So you don't want anything that's going to... not put pressure on my family, but also mm. just have them, get people talking about them or having these bad things because they're going to say it to them. They never say it to you as a kid. Mm. They always say it to you, to the parents. Mm. So it's like, for me, it's like managing the circumstances. So it's, mm. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a process. Um, but uh, we, we're, doing, we're doing well, I think, and we're happy to have Ocean. And yeah, we, I think we're stable enough and we're strong enough as a unit. So... We can't ever have someone come between us. That's mm. that's what matters as well. Final words from your side, Poppy. I think what I I would like um, people to know is that uh, it is possible to to have this family that you that you've dreamt of, um, regardless of of your gender or your sexuality or your race. That mm. families come in many different forms, um, and. Yeah, it's possible. There are resources out there. There, there is information out there. There are clinics and doctors who can help you through that. So I just wanted to maybe inspire some hope in people that have maybe doubted that they that this is possible to have a family. Um, that that we are maybe a good example that it is possible. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Poppy. Thank you so much, Nosi, for sharing your story with us about your daughter, Ocean, and the journey for you to get to this point. I think it's so beautiful that you are open about your story. Um, hopefully, it will destigmatize um, so many things that people have in mind, uh, but also sh- uh, give hope to those couples that are looking to build a family or even to single individuals that are looking to have a family. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Yes. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And Ocean behaved. <laughs> Hashtag unpacked with Rele Bukhile. I think my key takeaway from, from this conversation, you know, we look at certain procedures like wanting to have a child as a couple or as an individual, and you want to go the route of something like IVF. And it isn't possible because of money. I think for me, what I hope is that we can get to a point where we as a country are not considering such procedures as elective. It should be a person's right to be a parent. And the story that I've heard of today is a story of hope. And I hope that's what you also get an opportunity to take out of this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. I think within that, uh, the eighth month, if I can pre precisely say so, I find out that he's cheating. You told me there's nobody. Today, uh, it was not easy. I couldn't tell a lot of Hi, Abuti. Bye-bye. And then uh, little did I know that he was planning to kill me. So did they need to remove one bullet? What happened with the other bullet? It's still in my head. for watching Unpacked with Rilip Khilema. I want you to make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.